Good morning and welcome to worship. Please be seated. We can't do the regular greet that we normally do, but I'm going to assume that you are glad to be here. I am glad to see you, whether you are here in the sanctuary, or you in, or in Lockwood Hall, or you're joining us via the internet. We are glad that you have chosen to be a part of worship here at Port Williams United Baptist Church this morning. I do hope that as you came in, you were remembered to pick up some communion. If you are watching from home, we are sharing communion during the service, so please get some elements, some juice, some bread, so that you can join in with us later in the service. I do want to bring you some words. Um, I got a phone call this week from Milford Stevens, uh, <clears throat> who wanted me to relay to you his and Joyce's gratitude for the many ways in which you have reached out to them uh, during these days when she has had hip replacement surgery. Uh, she is at home and doing well, moving around. Um, but they wanted to express to you their gratitude for the cards, the calls, the food. It has made a great difference to them knowing that they are not alone during this time. It was a word of encouragement to all of us to see during these days uh, in which our normal routines, our normal ways of caring with it to each other have been disrupted, that we will remember to do those little things that many times are not that little. Uh, so thank you on their behalf. If you look this morning, you see that our poinsettias are all over the place. Um, thank you for those of you who have given one in honor or memory of of a loved one, if you would still like to do that, to purchase one of these, please let us know. Uh, they're $15 and you can drop the money off along with who they are uh, for, in memory of, or in honor of, uh, in the church office. It's a way that we can share and make a difference uh, this season. This is the second Sunday of Advent. The Sunday when, in just a moment, we will be lighting our candle of peace. And that is what we are in search of this day as we come to worship. So I invite you to take a breath, to center yourself, and together may we find the peace of God covering over us this day. Let us worship our God together.
Holy One, we light this second candle, a candle offering comfort to weary spirits after a year of pain and loss. Let its glow remind us of your tender care and warm our lives in the light of peace. Let it guide us to your presence in our midst, leading us to your justice and joy in the service of love. God, be with us in this light of peace. Let us hear what God will speak, tender words for the burdened people. Comfort, comfort, comfort my people. The day is the sorrow for many. Let us hear what God will speak, encouraging words for an anxious people. Prepare a way for the Holy One. Through deserts of despair, build a highway for our God. Hear what God will speak, words of vision for our weary people. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss. Come, let us worship. O Holy One, you are tender shepherd, architect of the way, beguiling hope of all who go looking for you deep in their lives. Surprise us here with sweetness, challenge, vision. Whatever we may need in this moment to recognize you and follow you into the future, we pray in the name of Jesus, the Beloved. Good morning. This morning we are reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all peoples shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift, lift it up. Do not fear, says to the cities of Judea. Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the, lambs in, the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
It's an opportunity for me to have a few words with our children, so I'm glad to see some of you in here. If you're at home, just gather around. This is a few moments for us. My question is, do you have a favorite part of the day? Those few moments that are your absolute favorite? Maybe, maybe it's right after you get home from school, and you get a snack and you settle down in a chair and you watch your favorite cartoon or TV show. Or maybe, or maybe it's right after supper when all of your homework is finished and, and you get to play a video game or just be. Or maybe, or maybe, maybe it's those moments right before you go to sleep, that wonderful place where you know what's going on, you, but you're not quite sure you could do anything about it right before you just fall off to sleep. I mean, do you have a favorite part of the day? Do you have that time where you just feel like everything is wonderful? The Bible has a word for that. It's called shalom. We translate it as being peace. Sometimes when we think about peace, what we mean is that time when our parents aren't yelling at us, that time when our teachers aren't giving us more and more homework, that time when our brothers or sisters aren't picking on us and being mean to us, that time when we don't have armies marching in fields, throwing bombs and hand grenades and, and blowing everybody up. And that's part of it. But when the Bible talks about peace, it's talking about that sense of wholeness, of knowing that all is well with the world. And the Bible says, in Christ, in Jesus, we find that peace, that sense that we are loved and beloved and everything is okay. This season... I hope that you will find those moments of peace. Maybe it's sitting in front of your, your Christmas tree, watching the lights twinkle, and just saying, all's well with the world. All's well with our family. And all's well with me. Find that place where you can crawl up into God's lap and just know that God loves you. Let's pray. God, it is in you that we find our peace. No matter what's going on around us, we pray that we might find that sense of well-being, of contentment in you, even this day. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Traditionally, a uh, finance and stewardship moment in December um, from the chair of a finance committee is a rallying cry for our congregation to get our checkbooks out and try and meet a deficit that uh, we've accumulated over the years. This morning, I'm in a fortunate position to just come before you and say thank you. Those who were able to attend the congregational meeting last week heard the positive news uh, about the financial report. As of the end of November, we are nearly meeting our budget for 2020. Our various committees put forward reasonable requests, and with the information from our pledge campaign, our financial and uh, stewardship committee prepared a 2021 budget, which was also accepted at the meeting. Again, thank you. Our congregants have been consistent in their giving throughout the year, despite not always being able to worship together in person. There was a lot of uncertainty in 2020, and yet our church has risen to the challenges presented. We do not take this for granted, and recognize that not every institution, whether it's church, charity, or other, is in the same fiscal position we see ourselves at this moment. 2021 will no doubt present many challenges, but I have no doubt there will also be great opportunities for this church as well. 
The Finance and Stewardship Committee is confident you will continue in your consistent giving going forward if you are able. We are already aware of certain needs to be presented by the Property Committee next year and would like to encourage you to give to the Christmas special offering which is going towards special project within the church. We are all praying that 2021 will be a better year than 2020. At least we have the reassurance that at Port Williams Baptist Church, we're here for each other in our times of need. Thank you. Our second reading is from Psalms 85, verse 1 to 2, and 8 to 13. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. God, we gather on this second Sunday of Advent, but it's unlike any journey to the manger that we've ever taken before. Rather than greeting each other with handshakes and hugs, we touch only with an elbow bump covered with our coats. Rather than sharing smiles that offer welcome, we wear masks that both protect us and hide us. Rather than packed into our sanctuary, we are socially distanced in this room, in Lockwood Hall, and even via the internet across your world. Rather than singing the songs that we love this season, we hum silently, wishing. God, this is the strangest advent we've ever experienced. We have been torn out of our traditions and our habits, and maybe, maybe God, that's the way it should be. For your coming turns things upside down. Normal is thrown out. Traditions are upended. The very order of life is topsy-turvy. In this world, we need you to show us the way to be ready for you. And so this day, O God, we pray that you might create in us the capacity for repentance and the vulnerable grace of openness. Use our friends as well as our critics to straighten, straighten out our twisted motives and smooth, rough moods. Make us ready for more of your healing in our lives. Grant us an increase of your nurturing spirit in the ordinary things of each day. For God, we do so want to be ready for your coming. So we pray that even this day we might make space for you. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who is coming and who is with us even now as we pray. Amen.
Thank you, guys. I will confess to you that there is a part of me that almost wishes we were virtual this morning. Not because I don't want to be here, not because I don't enjoy, love seeing your mask faces. But no, if, if we were virtual, even if we could all be in one room, I would show you a movie clip this morning. You would know it right away. It's because it's one of those Christmas movies right there with Home Alone, It's a Wonderful Life, Die Hard. And let me just say, no, Die Hard, just because a movie takes place at Christmas, it does not mean it's a Christmas movie. But this one, the one I wanted to show you is, I have it on good authority. I have it on the good authority of Allison Flowers Hollis and her high school friends. Because for years, they would gather all together at our house on Christmas Eve Eve to swap presents and watch Love Actually. And if I could, I would show you that first scene. People are are meeting and greeting in the airport in the pre-9-11 days. And you'd hear Hugh Grant say, whenever I get gloomy with the state of the world, I think of the arrival gate at Heathrow Heathrow Airport. General opinion starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed, but I don't see it. It seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly dignified or newsworthy, but it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husband and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, old friends, When the planes hit the Twin Towers, as far as I know, none of the phone calls from the people on board were messages of hate or revenge. They were all messages of love. If you look for it, I've got a sneaky feeling you'll find that love is actually all around. I thought about that scene when I read our psalm lesson for this morning. In a year in which we can't sing our familiar carols and our much-loved Christmas songs in worship, we're taking this opportunity to remember the songs that Jesus would have known. Somehow I think that the, the adolescent Jesus would have loved these lines from Psalm 85. Let me just say at least grown-up adolescent Don Flowers loved them. Did you hear it? Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. It's a line that shouldn't be just read unless you have a soundtrack behind it. Or even better, it's a, it's a line that should be sung with all the Celine Dion kind of romance around it, with full orchestration. I mean, can you see it? Can you imagine it in your mind? Righteousness and peace are running down that eternal concourse of the Toronto airport, running and running and running until almost out of breath, until they see each other and fling themselves into a passionate kiss, not caring who's watching. It's wonderful to watch. Have you ever seen such a scene in the airport? Have you ever wondered what is the backstory? What, who are these people? Who are they? Long parted husband and wife, an engaged couple just seeing each other before their wedding, old friends seeing each other for the first time in a long, long time. One year as a youth minister, our group found ourselves stranded in the Miami airport. Our flight was delayed and then canceled and then rerouted and then redone all over again. For about 12 hours, we sat there in the airport in limbo, wondering if or when we might leave. I mean, what do you do when there's nothing else to do? So a few of us came up with a diversion. As we sat there and watched all these people coming and going, 
the other people who were getting to go to places that we obviously would never get to go to, we made up stories about them. Who were they? Where were they going? What is the story about that couple? Her, still, still in her wedding gown. That one was easy. Who's that couple over there pushing a stroller? Where are they going? To see parents? Are they going home? How about that guy over there wearing sunglasses? Inside? Hmm. Maybe a Soviet spy heading home. Maybe, maybe a vision-impaired songwriter on the way to sign a lucrative record contract. Oh, we'll never know who they were, really. Ah, but the stories we came up with, it helped pass the time. See, we just asked, asked the story. What's, what's the story behind that scene? What's the story behind the scene of this psalm this morning? We get a hint, we, especially if we read the verses that were left out. If we read those, we hear some of the behind-the-scenes story. Lord, you were favorable. You restored. You forgave. You pardoned. You withdrew. You turned. They're all past tense. All past tense verbs. This is something that God did in the past. Scholars believe that this psalmist is looking back to the days in which the people were in exile in Babylon. But God had been merciful back then. God had brought them back home. And all of their dreams and prayers were answered. And yet, and yet when they got home, it wasn't what they had expected or dreamed or even remembered from their parents' stories. The crops were devastated this wasn't a land flowing with milk and honey. The temple was in ruin, not the gold-laden place where God lived. Even the leaders, the people, were this strange mixture of people with all sorts of new and strange gods that were worshipped. And in that environment, in that environment, their hearts just sank. Some of them went back to their old ways and the cycle just repeated itself in the verses that are left out for this week, we hear a plea for God that echoes the one we heard last week. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. A couple of things I think we need to note here. The pronouns, the pronouns here are plural. It's us, all of us, your people. This isn't a cry for personal salvation. As important and as needed as that might be. Too often, we as Baptists have emphasized personal salvation so much that we miss out on the fact that the Bible speaks of confession, of repentance, of salvation for everyone, for all people. It's plural. We, we, all of us, we, need to have God's salvation restored to us. But that can only happen if we're willing to be honest about what we have done. If we're, being, if we're willing to be honest about the pain we are experiencing, the pain we have caused. We've seen that played out at times in our world. After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission granted her son amnesty for killing Amy Bill, who was a 26-year-old Fulbright scholar living in South Africa, Evelyn McKenna said, to the commission, and to the families. As a mother, I am very happy. But on the other hand, I am not happy. I feel the pain of Ms. Spiel. I am not happy because of what my child has done. See, she wasn't dismissing the action. 
She wasn't dismissing the pain. But as a way of looking towards the future, of not holding on to the pain, of not holding on to the anger, the hatred, and allowing healing and peace to take root. You see, so often we do limit our idea of peace. It's like I said to the children, too often we dream of the day when ICU beds won't be filled to overflowing with COVID patients, when families won't have to meet through a, a glass window or a computer screen to see parents and loved ones, when we can gather with families for Christmas dinner as a congregation for worship and hug and be we dream of a time when there's no warfare, when we won't have troops in faraway lands, when daily RCMP officers aren't called out to investigate domestic abuse, sexual assaults, and murders. We could just have those things disappear, right? If those things would just disappear, then we'd have peace. But the biblical view of peace is so much deeper. The word for peace, shalom, carries with it not only a lack of conflict, but a sense of well-being, of knowing that all is right with the world. And to get to that point, we have to be willing to be courageous, to take a long, hard look at our lives, at our lives, both individually and collectively. And that is hard. That is hard. We would prefer to leave those conversations lost, lost back there in history. I mean, really. Do we really need to talk about the way settlers treated the indigenous people? Why should we worry about residential schools? We didn't operate one. Why should we be concerned about the misuse of our planet? We will be long gone before that bill comes due. Why be excised about the care of senior adults during this pandemic? We're not in charge. I'm not responsible, and my parents aren't in one of them. You see, these are hard conversations. And we often just assume that the discomfort, the embarrassment, the hard choices just won't lead anywhere. And so we just don't risk them. We don't join in the struggle. Besides, those are political conversations. Let's just leave it to those people in Ottawa to worry about. But Walter Brueggemann reminds us that the church is a conversation with human hurt. The church is a conversation with human hurt. And when we avoid those conversations, the alienation we all feel, the pain, the anger, the resentment, it just grows stronger and makes peace less likely, less likely in us and in our world. In the days of apartheid in South Africa, Bishop Desmond Tutu had returned home from one of his international trips in which he had been encouraging support for the struggle against the racial policies of his country. At a news conference at the airport in Johannesburg, he was asked whether he was worried about having his passport confiscated again. He responded, having one's passport taken away is not the worst thing that can happen. Even for a Christian, even being killed is not the worst thing, he said. He continued, for me, one of the worst things would be if I woke up one day and said to the people, I think apartheid's not so bad. For me, this would be worse than death. You see, there are worse things. There are worse things than this pandemic, worse than the separations and isolation. Worse than the divisions that seem to, be, seem to be creeping across our southern border. There are worse things even than the 12,000 plus deaths that we have experienced. Even worse. Even worse would be if we fail to have the hard conversations. 
to do the hard work that might lead to real shalom, to real peace, to real, to real well-being for all of us. To have a conversation about what it would really look like if the kinship of God became a reality in our midst. What would it mean about health care for our most vulnerable? Would people be worried about shelter, staying warm this winter? Would our food bank really be necessary? What would it mean if God's love for the world meant the world, the physical planet on which we live? Would we be polluting the ground and the water and the air? How would we share and care for the resources of crops, of our oceans? What would it mean? What would it mean? Can we have those conversations around our dining room tables, in our church? Are we willing, even willing to have those conversations to imagine what it might look like when righteousness and peace kiss? The psalmist tells us what it will look like. The Lord will give us what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make a path for his steps. Oh, might it be so, even this day. Amen. We read it. God so loved the world, the whole world, that he sent Jesus. Jesus loved us so much that he followed those paths no matter where it ended. We come this day, this time, to share remembrance, to remember, to remind ourselves of what that means, of what it means to follow in discipleship, to build a world in which righteousness and peace kiss. The night before he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, any bread, remember, remember. Then he took a cup. And he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you. Every time you drink this, remember that peace, that love, that life is costly. God loves you that much. As we share this together, may we remember. Good morning. Let us pray. When we have been prisoners to our own fears, you have set us free. When we have been blind to the needs of others, you have opened our eyes. When we have been low in spirit, you have lifted us up. When we have hungered, you have given us bread. Let this bread of communion remind us, O oh God, that you provide for our deepest needs that in the presence of Jesus Christ, we have found our nourishment and strength. As we drink from the small cup, O creator of hope and peace, we realize that we are drinking spiritually from the wellspring of all peace. We affirm that the refreshment that comes from Christ's presence in our lives is a source of peace that will never run dry. Help us remember, gracious God, that as you have met our needs, it is for a purpose. You want us to be your people, bringing freedom, light, and hope to the world around us. Amen. It's a plural. It's a plural verbs there. Us, we, and we share this together today. Peel back the top, take this bread, 
May we eat and remember. As we peel back the cup, may we remember that this is given for all of us. Thanks be to God. To you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this shall be the sign. The sign will be the peace that we share and with our world, with each other this day. Thank you for being a part of this outpost of God's kingdom here in worship at Port Williams. It is a gift for all of us. And I do want to say thank you for all the gifts that have been given. Let me echo what Scott said about the gifts that you have shared with our congregation and the ministry. It's just not been to our budget. I mean, we have done incredible things. We have sent latrines to El Salvador. We have furnished some tangible goods for students at Horton High School. Right now, we are trying to take up an offering for our uh, facility here to make sure that our internet services, our worship services are funneled and streamed better. We invite you to be a part of that. And if you'd like to contribute to our Christmas offering or to any of our offerings, please go to our website, pwubc.org. There's a donate button. You can click that and let us know where you want your gifts to go to make a difference in our world, and we will make sure they get there. I also want to say thank you to all the people who have written uh, our Advent devotions this year. If you are here in person and want a physical copy, they're out there on the table. Please pick one up. If you are online, you can also go to our website, click on the Advent button at the headline, and you can find them there each day. Um, special thanks to those of you who have written. Special thanks to Anita Flowers, who is posting them every morning. Um, so, I mean, what else does she have to do in isolation, right? Um, she's free tomorrow morning, so, um, so thank you. And Aaron and Thomas, thank you. Thank you for this gift this morning. It is a small way, a tangible way in which you have shared your gifts with us, and I deeply appreciate it. One of the losses we have this season is that normally on uh, Christmas Eve, the Sunday before Christmas, we have our children do a Christmas pageant. We, on Christmas Eve, we have all their musical talent shared. We can't do that this year. But, but, children, this is to you. Parents, to you also. If you would like to follow Thomas and Aaron today and share something in our worship services, if you will let Christiane know, we want to share your gifts uh, 
with our congregation. We miss you. Um, so I think that is everything that I was supposed to say today. Um, again, thank you for being here with us in worship. Um, if there are ways that we can be of assistance to you, meaningful to you, please let us know during this season. We go from this place to be ambassadors of God's peace to our world. So as we go, will you hear our benediction? You are the people of God. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that our world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So go now. And as you go, may the Lord take your hands and work through them. May the Lord take your lips and speak through them. May the Lord take your hearts and set them on fire, both now and forevermore.